Hey everybody, my name is Jim Farmer. I'm the festival director of Out on Film, Atlanta's LGBTQ Film Festival. This is our 36th year and we have an amazing lineup this year. Um, one of the films that we are showing um, as part of our Queer Horror Night is a great psychological thriller called Birder. Let me read a description right quick and then we'll meet the director. In Birder, a bird watcher, Christian Brooks, invades a nude queer campground on a remote lake in New Hampshire. He wears whatever cover he needs to ensnare the locals in his dark fetish in this nightmarish erotic thriller where consent is deadly. The director of the film is Nate Dusku. Nate Dusku is actually an alumni of Out on Film. He was a producer of Maple Thorpe in 2008, which was a big hit for us. Thanks so much, Nate. Thank you, Jim. It's great I to am, be here back in Atlanta. I, we, you know, we, we all saw this film. It's like, wow, we, we got to show this. I mean, we, it is, our program is sort of all watched it like in the span of like two days. We, we got it. We all watched it. We like, oh my God, we had to show this film. We really, really enjoyed this. It, it felt different than anything we'd seen. So how did, tell us Love how Burger came up for you. Well, uh, if we think back to kind of where the pandemic um, was ending and, yeah. uh, you know, we all kind of had gone through this change in our lives and we had this other film um, that we were working on. It just was not, it was centered around a bunch of uh, elderly people. And we felt like that might be a challenge to uh, jump into at that time. And, you know, we were, I was back in Boston with my folks and we were kind of escaping up to, um, you know, this, this community in particular, which is on a river in Vermont, you know, this sex positive queer community where we could just kind of be outside with our friends and, you know, try and, you know, deal with what was going on, what was happening. And my partner, who's my husband and I were thinking, you know, what, what can we, what can we put out into the world? And, you know, I, I kind of uh, prefer to exist in this space where, um, you know, things are sometimes ugly, life imitates art. You know, I mean, maybe this is a time for, you know, a queer rom-com or, you know, it's important to laugh and things like that, but I'm kind of more, most comfortable in the like, in-between spaces where, um, you know, we're telling the truth about the dread that we often feel in the queer community. So we were like sitting up there along the banks of this river, sunbathing, nude, and thought what would be the scariest thing that could happen here? And there it was, it was, you know, what if somebody amongst us was not who they appeared to be? Yeah. Yeah. And it, you know, I think as a filmmaker, I, I think it's important to entertain and you don't just want to kind of like rake your audience up over the coals. I mean, some, some filmmakers do, and I can appreciate that as well, but um, it was wanting to tell a story that was impactful, mm -hmm. but also really wanting to take them on a ride and, you know, give people a world, a, a window into this world um, yeah. of a, this joyous sex positive community, but not ignore, you know, the issues that we're facing today. Exactly. Were there any particular influences on this film in, in terms of other films that you wanted to try to emulate or, or, or parallel? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one film that was, you know, in the beginning, we were calling this Gay Get Out. Um, we kind of threw that aside because we felt like it was ultimately not where we landed. But that movie is, um, you know, really interesting because it's kind of, you know, it's 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 dealing with a place where our trauma, our dread is lived. You know, it's not necessarily like we're not making up monsters. We don't need blood splattering everywhere. Um, in the more heteronormative, cis normative world, where you have a thriller or a horror, you kind of have to make up the monster. In our lives, just like Get Out, um, in some ways, the dread is staring us in the face, um, and Another movie that was, you know, I think very close to, in the beginning, you know, again, uh, Stranger by the Lake, I don't know if you've obviously seen that film, you know, yeah. it's like, um, in some ways, very similar to what we're doing, but very different because it's a different country, a different community, and it's a different time. But, um, yeah, it's like we're, su we're, we're supporting people that are talking about their real life trauma and, um, you know, not everybody right now, I mean, it's it's great that we're at this point where, you know, 
you know, we drag queens can teach people how to slay and how to be joyful and all this stuff. But I think that um, films where the trauma is real, um, those two films in particular, um, really in the beginning were inspiration. I think also a film like uh, American Psycho was mm -hmm. up there, kind of, you know, this, I mean, it's, he's a little different because he's had a sight, this, that character, uh, Patrick Bates, Bateman has had this uh, psychotic break and it's a little different. Our, our protagonist it has, is pathologically driven. He is a psychopath, but in this way that it was told from the first person, you know, what it would be like to be in the body of the killer. You, you, you summarized it perfectly. I mean, because this is an environment where you wouldn't expect this. One of us turns out to be not who he says he is. And, you know, there's a certain mm -hmm. vulnerability about these characters who are there ha having no idea you know, who this new person is. In terms of, you know, the main character, Christian Brooks, did you, did you, did you write a lot of backstory or did you deliberately leave a lot to, you know, our imagination? Um, we, we knew that we uh, were going to be telling the story from the first person and that he was going to be a psychopath, pathologically driven. Yeah. And, we, but we didn't, you know, we honestly, when Michael Emery, who plays Christian, started sending the self tapes, he really helped us because, you know, you always have a vision, you know, this kind of idealistic vision. And they always ask you, who do you want? And you want your, your mind is often drawn to stars or actors that are big that you like out there. Um, but then he started sending us these tapes and actually we started an email correspondence and text correspondence because right away he's just very magnetic to watch but he he was building the backstory and it was interesting to me what it was it wasn't necessarily um everything that i'd thought of before but um i think part of what i love about the film is that we're not really telling you why or giving you much of the backstory he's just kind of there and it um and it's important to be in the moment with that character and letting things unfold and so i would say there was a lot of backstory there from his point of view but from my mm -hmm. point of view didn't really matter i mean that there's different approaches to acting as well you know i think he michael comes from the theater and creating the backstory is important to his process but for me i just wanted to see it come to life and i think he had an emotional connection to the role and um, he figured out how to make all of the actions and words of this character very honest. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, far beyond so many of the other readings we'd seen. I, I, and I don't know what it is. I mean, maybe he's a little bit of a psychopath himself. I think that all actors and artists are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, this, the backstory is there, but what was most important is kind of um, seeing this creature in this community um, of open-minded people and letting the action speak for themselves. And so most of his work has been in the theater, correct? We'll have to we'll have to edit that one back together. <laughs> hey there, hey there. Some editing oh, to do there. Again. Yeah. So we were talking about Michael. So Michael is predominantly his background is mostly in the theater, theater community. Yes, I mean he's done a ton of TV and film since then, but he trained in the theater, um, and that was really nice. Um, it actually was interesting when we went to New York because a lot of people were casting off of Zoom, off of Zoom and off of video and stuff. And I just was fearful of that. And so, you know, the pandemic was coming to an end and we really tried to narrow down, um, you know, who we were really strongly considering because we didn't want, many people hadn't done in-person auditions yeah. um, since the pandemic began. And so this was their first. So we didn't want to, you know, Call too many people into the room and we were just trying to 
basically meet them and shake their hand and say, I, I kind of knew that he was a guy, but um, him showing up and his attitude towards the work and the way that he behaved in the, you know, because I come from an acting background too. So, um, but the way that he behaved in the room, it was all very affirm affirming for us um, because, you know, this was a very tiny movie and it was, we were crying, requiring a lot of that actor. Um, it was ultra low budget. You know, we were asking them to, bear it all and um i wanted we we brought on an intimacy coordinator actually in the casting process because i was really nervous about an actor kind of showing up and then kind of backing out of a lot of these mm -hmm. um promises or intentions that they had and you know that's that's kind of part of this new frontier of using an intimacy coordinator for any yeah. type of nudity or simulated sex but after asking Michael in person and looking him in the eye and saying, is this really what you want to do? And, you know, are you, are you game for all this and seeing, you know, I believed him when he said, you know, I want this and I, and I, and I see this and I want to work as well as. You mentioned, obviously, you know, the, 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 there is some frankness in the film and there is, there's some nudity a lot. Um, and then there's some sexual content. I mean, did you have, did you have problems finding cast members or was everybody What's the with the material? They're pretty much game for the for the ride. Well, the the actors that we ended up hiring were game and were all incredible. That's um, you know daring, um, but you know this being my first film and it being ultra low, it's ultra low budget. It's in that category with the union. It's hard uh, to get people on board for that. Um, sure. Even the casting sites. I mean, you know, we were. You know, basically, I think we've been told before that certain agencies, if an ultra low budget SAG film comes across their desk, they just kind of like brush it aside just because the money's so low. So then on top of it, asking them to take their clothes off was another, you know, an, an added fact. It's like, oh, hell no, we're not going to do that for this much money. Hmm. Um, but, you know, one of the actors put it pretty Clearly, it's like, you know, I think as an actor, you, you think maybe you might be asked to do that someday. Maybe not. Maybe it's against your religion. Maybe it's against, you know, your, you know, idea for your future. But you think, hey, if it's something, if it if it if it's important to the story, then I would do it. And um, fortunately enough, the actors that, you know, came to the table and said, yes, I want to do this. Even, you know, we asked them over and over, are you sure? Are you sure? And why? Um, they felt it was important to the story. They felt like this was a world that hadn't really been put on film exactly. in this way. And um, yeah, I think the intimacy coordinator really does help though when you're going out to all these actors and their agents and telling them we're using an intimacy coordinator of the highest level, yeah. they feel much more protected. And um, you know, they used to be it used to be that if you were asked to go nude or do a simulated sex scene, you just say the producers would be like, all right, here's a here's a shot, you know, just loosen up kind of thing. Now it's down to the T, you know, what part of the body is being shot you know, how many seconds on camera and why, and are you comfortable? Um, am I comfortable if an actor changes their mind when they're on set? And so there's this kind of like trust that you place in people, but you also never want to be coercive. So the intimacy coordinator really helped me and the actors find a very like safe playground, um, but also helped us all to feel confident that when we showed up on set, we weren't really going to be changing the rules, you know? So it was it was really a, a wonderful experience in that regard, because even though the film can feel very dangerous at times and um, at, on set, it was um, actually pretty, pretty comfortable. Can you talk a little bit about the segue into directing? Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's an interesting thing, the path, uh, you know, that I took. And I think a lot of it has to do with the circumstances of my life and my family and you know I was a performer as a kid and my my grandparents met doing Gilbert and Sullivan musical and my mom did it and my sister is a Hollywood actress or was I should say and so I kind of had it around me and I was always in the theater and I was a performer but even when I was a kid as an actor I always kind of like took on the the uh you know the challenge of the production and I loved making it better from every angle and so I went on to acting school and I think that's where I really realized I, I started shadowing theater directors. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you know the actor David Pitu from New York. Um, I was an assistant director for him and, and at, in the theater and Karen Colehouse from the Atlantic Theater Company. And 
I started to just feel like the pressure of being on screen or on stage was was uh, not what I wanted, but I wanted to, you know, be a part of the, the story and the storytelling. And so going into producing was very natural. And again, always kind of part of what it was as an actor, you know, just kind of being there to make it happen. And then I think on my last film, I just realized like, I'm ready for this. And it just felt very natural. Honestly, I've been on enough sets to know the mechanics of the film set. Um, I think it was just, you know, getting over the fear of putting all those pieces together. Like I, I, I love working with actors. I know how um, a set works. And so I, I knew that I, it was, it was all there. And actually uh, it did, it did feel very natural to me. We shot this thing in 12 days. I mean, it's, I, I was, yes, I was terrified of failing and, or things falling apart. But, you know, as we hit the second week and I was like, wow, we we're just plowing through these days and this feels good. I mean, you don't really know until you look back, but yeah, I think it, um, it worked out and I, I really am looking forward to the next one. Nice. Something I've noticed, I, I've always been a fan of um, horror films, thrillers. Um, I've noticed that over the years, there are a lot more, you know, queer centric thrillers. You know, can I mean, do you find that way too? And do you have any explanation as to why, you know, that genre is 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 richer these days? Yeah, I've been noticing that too. Actually, and it almost feels like it's in the past six months or something. Yeah. It's like yeah. these dark queer stories are. Um, you know, obviously we're hearing about them now, and they've been you know, in the works because many of them are completed, but I think it's the time we're in. I think that, you know, queer cinema is really special in that way. Um, it's, you know, in the world right now, um, being queer is not always easy. You know, we're up again. I mean, it's being alive, being human is not easy in the world today, but, um, you know, being queer with the choices being made by the government, the, our society, it's it's tough. And so queer cinema is special in that way because it's kind of the the place where we deal with those struggles. And so I think that in some ways, you know, maybe this is a renaissance of dark queer cinema because, you know, people, like I was saying earlier, it's important to tell the truth. It's, it's important to laugh. And I think that, you know, in our film, hopefully there's, there's some laughter as well and some um, feel good moments, but I think, you know, ultimately telling the truth and um, dealing with the trauma that we face and sharing it and being loud about it is um, for me, a really important way of dealing with it personally, but also um, I think it's important in, in, in cinema. And so I love it. I love the different angles people are taking with queer dark stuff and it's it's hard but it's also a thriller and i mm -hmm. think in general queer cinema even with like i said you know with laughter i mean there's so many there's a lot of great feel good coming of age stories that are just you know of the time exactly this this film is is, is pretty new i think we're one of the first festivals that are showing it I'm, I'm so excited for our audience to see it um tell us what's next for the film and what's next for you What's next for the film? So, well, this is one of the first. We did have our first showing in Durham, North mm -hmm. Carolina, um, which was a treat. Um, I love Durham and then like this little queer community in North, in a, in North Carolina, which is um, an interesting, beautiful state that has a lot going on. In some ways, you know, the, the fact that we sh chose to shoot New Hampshire, which is also a very, you know, politically divided state, mm -hmm. um, it, 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 it shows for an interesting place to show the film, you know, Atlanta uh, as well. Look at what's going on in Atlanta. I, I was stoked that um, we were programmed at the festival because there's this strong, loud um, LGBT community um, and surrounded by people that don't always agree with how we feel. And so um, we're going to Seattle. We're going to, um, Tel Aviv, you know, we're going to these queer communities where I think the film is resonating. Um, yeah. it's, it's people that are saying we're surrounded by danger and 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 we're gonna be we're gonna talk about it. So the film festival circuit and the the queer film festival circuit in particular is is you know 
showing us some love. And I'm just, you know, Washington, D.C. is another one where we're playing there. So, you know, we're on the circuit and we're we're still seeking distribution. But more importantly, you know, we've got two months ahead of screening to our community. And that's like just all I could have ever um, asked for this fil- this little film. Yeah, um, but hopefully like it goes beyond that. Like I said, it, there's a lot of distributors taking risks and taking on um, different types of queer films. And we'll see where that goes. I'm hopeful. And um, yeah, then I'm already working on the next one. It's um, it's a little different <laughs> than this one. Um, like I said, it's it's about um, uh, a crew of septuagenarians in Florida that um, are play bridge. So it's you know, some people are like, oh, it's so it's not about a bunch of queers and. You know, I think that that's something that I'll take with me wherever I go. And my writing partner, like I said, is my husband. And, you know, I think between um, he writes, I direct, and the, the combination of what we do in the world that we created. And honestly, when I saw the film finished, that first time that I could start to feel the magic and not think about all the little things, um, I'm like, wow, we have a vibe. You know, we have a, <laughs> we have a queer vibe and mm-hmm. it's not in space. And I don't want to lose that. But I don't necessarily think that um, our, you know, our protagonist has to be ourself. You know, queer can be, you know, even on our set, we had a lot of, um, I would say, what's the proper word, you know, non-binary, straight queers. Mm -hmm. So I think that queer, you know, the meaning is not always clear to everybody, but I'd like to think that it's going to be a queer world. by just the the nature of the characters and their challenges, but definitely the setting is very different. And um, I think um, the nudity and the the sex that's in Birder was very specific to this script and this. I'm not I'm not gonna say that the next one's gonna be pushing the boundaries in the same way in that regard. But I think the humor and the darkness um, yeah. and the the queerdom will exist. Great. All right, the film Birder screens at Out on Film on Friday, September the 29th, and it will be followed by a brief streaming window as well. Uh, Director Nate Dushku, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I cannot wait for audiences to see this. Um, Thanks again, and we look forward to, to having more of your films. Thank you, Jim. Thank you.